All right, Alexis, what is it you want to learn about today? I heard sort of about there was power outages during that snowstorm and like there was problems about it in Texas and there were problems about it in Texas. Right. So um, Texas is the one that's made the news the most, um, but there were problems in several other states. So we never lost our power. But uh, there were places in Oklahoma that did have uh, rolling blackouts. And so uh, there's already been a lot of talk about, you know, why that happened or what happened. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll sort of go through. But the first thing is, is let's talk about, like, what is a grid failure? Have you heard of a grid, like an electrical grid? It's not not like the Tron grid. <laughs> I've heard of both. Okay. So an electrical grid is basically like a bunch of interconnected um, electricity stuff, right? So like there's power generation plants and, you know, there's customers all around. And we have all of these different lines in between them that connect them all together and the i are your like devices that the energy goes to part of this technically like on a really small level everything that's plugged into uh an outlet is part of the grid right Dang. uh because it's it's drawing power so right now the laptop is it is a load on the system it is drawing power it is connected to the grid so most people don't think about it that micro. They just think of it in terms of like a home or something like that. But yes, everything that's plugged in is connected to the grid. Okay, now the grid taking over the normal world in Tron Legacy doesn't seem that impossible anymore. Oh, uh, well, that, that's a I'm computer just grid. I'm just so, joking. Yeah. I'm joking. Let me make a joke. <laughs> okay. Um, and the idea is similar to a computer network. Which is that is that if so let's let's say something really bad happens to um, this power generator over here, or let's say these these transmission lines over here get destroyed. In theory, your grid can still provide you with service because even if it can't get out through here, that these other places. Can still feed into it and so there's multiple paths to feed the same customers does that make sense yeah and so it's supposed to be stable um one of the features of the electric grid however is that it is all real time so it is on demand um so demand so the load that we put on it D -E -M -A -N -D, <laughs> demand must equal supply or it collapses. Okay. Wow. So electricity is notoriously difficult to store, right? We've got batteries and things like that for small devices. Car battery. Yeah, but they're not terribly efficient and they don't, they don't scale up in the ways that we need them to for the entire electrical grid. We need uh, a lot of car batteries for that well right now the most efficient uh form of storing electrical energy is what they call pumped hydro what? and so basically they have a mountain with a reservoir at the top oh, okay. and when they have extra electricity right. they use pumps to pump the water all the way up to the top and then when they have extra demand they reverse it and those pumps turn into generators and it when the water flows back downhill it it turns back into electricity. Uh, yeah, it's right now. It is the most effective. It's the most efficient means of storing electricity. That's is complicated. Yeah, and it's it's fairly simple in principle. It's it's not great. It's it's not very dense. It doesn't sound that great. Like, I mean, it's the best that we have available. Electricity is super hard mm -hmm. to store over a long period of time. Well, the clouds it, do fine. Well, no, they're making that when they're making lightning. They're making it right up there, right? Yes. 
that there's a bunch of little clouds rubbing yeah, balloons on their hair <laughs> to make yeah, static electricity zap you. So they're not actually storing the electricity, they're making it and discharging it. Yep. Okay. So what happens is if the supply and demand get out of balance, then the grid collapses and everything just falls apart. Um, Chaos. Yes. So if you have too much supply, it's actually pretty easy to imagine how that works. So if we just had a ton of electricity and then when we were just dumping it onto the grid and no one was using it, like the, the equipment would overheat, any electric uh, devices that were plugged in, they would get too much charge and it would start frying stuff and everything would just burn up. If we had like a Griswold level light display. Yeah. Okay, so that is too much demand. So just, yes, like in the Griswold, whenever uh, he plugs his light in and they had all the lights go down oh. and then they switch on the nuclear reactor <laughs> yes. to get an extra boost, that right? So that's too much demand. Yeah. And what happens in that case is, um, so whenever you plug a device in your wall socket, yes. it, it is basically getting energy produced from a, a power generator, like a power plant somewhere, yeah. and it's within minutes. Oh, maybe, maybe even faster. That's pretty fast, though. And <laughs> it's a little more complicated than, than just you just plug it in and you get the juice. Uh, they do have some safety features in between it, but pretty much when you plug something in or you flip on a switch... The pa a power plant somewhere has to create demand to de to meet it, sure. right? It's basically like, it, it's almost like always on. Yeah. And so if you imagine we've got a plug, right, and we just keep plugging devices into it. It's suffering. Well, it's going to start just sucking more and more juice into it. Um so we had this problem at one of my offices, the people would daisy chain the, uh, the, the surge protectors. What? <laughs> and they would plug like space heaters and stuff like that what into them and it would... Was it cold? They were cold. You were in an office building. It was all, it was cold office building. Get a jacket. <laughs> anyway, they had to because they were burning up all the plugs. <laughs> um... All of that demand, it just keeps drawing more and more and more from it. Like, and what happens is if we have, um, you know, let's say we've got a power plant over here. And yeah, that's supposed to be like a cooling tower. Like, you see that. They like emit steam or steam heat. Yeah. And so let's say we've got these three power plants. And all of a sudden our customers, whoever they are, they just start asking for just tons and tons of power. Well, what happens is if there's not enough, um, there's not enough production to meet that demand, um, it'll start creating like overheating and problems in the generators. And all of a sudden, um, it could either damage it or the way it's most likely to happen is safety features will kick in and safety features will shut that plant off. Oh, thank goodness. I was like, if this is like nuclear energy, thank you for safety features. No, well, nuclear energy well, has yeah, good I safety know. features. It's, I was like, I know it's not that bad, but like still just to be yeah, sure. We're not going to get mushroom cloud. That's a <laughs> terrible mushroom cloud. But so what happens is when that one kicks off, okay, so there's way too much demand for these three power plants. And then one of them shuts down. Oh, crap. That's so now bad. all of that demand is having to come from two of them. Oh, my God. And then another one shuts down, right? This and, poor yeah. electric plant. So let's predict where that, what happens to this poor electric plant. <laughs> it shuts down. <laughs> That's an even worse mushroom. Thought. So yes. It's like a tree. So you... None of them mushroom cloud. Those, yeah, that's all bad. That's not true. But they shut down to protect their equipment. Like the generators are going to go overheat. The transformers are going to overheat because they're just pull, They're trying to, the, the load, which is what it's called whenever you're trying to draw electric power, is just trying to pull way too much through the system. Mm -hmm. 
and all of that stuff um, is going to be damaged or there's going to be heating problems or uh, it's going to trip safety features or it's going to throw breakers um, you know or fuses or things like that things that are meant to protect the system um, all the, you know uh, if it's bad enough the like copper wires have resistance in them and so eventually like they basically turn into little heaters and the wires themselves will start burning up if you start running just tons and tons of load through them. This is why you turn off your lights when you leave. Well, so, oh, no, not really, so this is the problem is whenever the snowstorm hit, there was a huge increase in demand and there was a huge drop in supply. Yep. And all of a sudden, you start getting these uh, and so to prevent that kind of cascading failure they would uh, issue a rolling blackout and so like if we've got customers over here what do you mean issue a blackout? How do you so the that? so the grid operators have some control and they'll basically say we've only got enough demand to meet two of these at a time and so to to keep the grid from collapsing and, and, and everyone being out of power, we're going to shut your power off for like two hours. Uh, and then we're going to shut your power off for two hours. That's actually kind of smart. Well. Well, it was. It, it's a, it is the best answer to a bad situation. Because if you don't do something like that, then you 100%, everybody loses power. Because you get that cascading failure whenever we drew up. So that's what's happening. Or what did happen. The reason that it happened, um, and people have been trying to figure out to what extent all these different things were. It was like a perfect storm, and, and not just because it was a snowstorm, like all of the different things. So um, one of the things that people have brought up is Texas's electrical grid is completely independent. So like if you look at a map of the electrical grids in the United States, like there's one for the West, there's a big one for the east. There might be another one up in the northeast. And then there's Texas. <laughs> and the reason that Texas um, has theirs is because they want to avoid federal regulation. So if there's connections between states, then it becomes a federal thing and the feds will institute additional regulation. Um, so the judge that we had at the jackpot, the guy that likes the shiny jackets. Yeah. He has a podcast, and he and his buddy were talking about the the thing. He says it's it's because eventually Texas wants to be their own country. They oh, they always try. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Texas is so small though. Not like I mean, compared to other countries, Dad. Like Texas is bigger than France. I would dang poor France. I mean, like some countries are much bigger, but like yeah. I don't know how well that would work out. <laughs> Well, they used to be their own country, and they, they, first, they, wait, they Texas <clears throat> used to be their own country. Yes. They don't teach me that in history. Yeah. And, and Texans like to hold on to it like it's a threat, like we'll be our own country again sometime in the future. Not really like a threat, but they, <clears throat> they are very independent. Well, it's good <clears throat> to be independent, but I don't know if like Texas would just be like its own country. That sounds like a terrible idea. Anyway. Um... <clears throat> So they're not interconnected. And so some people say, oh, well, you know, these crazy Texans, if they would have been <laughs> connected to the grid, like, you know, to the other grids, like, like everyone world. else, yeah, then they could have shared power from other states. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's 2021 arc big arc big blast. What? That's what it's called. Uh, uh, wait, we have a name for it already? Well, yeah. Oh. That is a snowmobile. Apparently it's also the name of a brand of snowmobile. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, I, think, I think I saw something. What's that? Okay. Uh, this might work. So, um... Yeah. Uh, what happened was there is this thing called polar vortex. And it's all this cold spinning air up around the poles. And, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, 
And what happened is, is when that, that stream of air, it usually keeps the, the cold air trapped up by the poles, but sometimes it will get out of balance. And what happened in our case is there was basically a big, um, big swoop down. And so we got cold polar air that got to basically drive down. Oh man, that's, uh, okay. Close uh, enough. it's close enough. Um, drive air, that cold Arctic air came down from the poles into, um, continental United States. So, uh, even if, uh, here, let's do this. You probably should have thought of that. Or, oh, that one, that one looks right. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what happened. Now, if you look around though, so here is... Texas, yeah, I see. the future independent republic of Texas. <laughs> what states around it are avoiding the huge cold? Uh, I see. Right, so we know that we had power problems uh, here. Uh, and uh, so even if New Mexico uh, didn't get a ton of it, um, that's very sparsely populated state. I doubt they have just a ton of generation just laying around um, that they could have uh, fed into Texas. So, um, like, we probably can't blame, you know, Texas independence and the future independent republic of Texas for this particular problem because in this case, the neighboring states were so cold and we know that uh, several of them had their own uh, power generation issues that being interconnected with other states was probably not going to save them. And if it did, it was not going to have an effect. I mean, like a large effect. Um, one of the other things that people like to bring up, people who like government, is uh, Texas is very deregulated. You mean people who like politics or people who like the government? People who think that government can solve problems. Uh, um, and so one of the things that other parts of the country have is they, they have a minimum generation capacity. And so these government agencies will go and they'll look at your, you know, uh, demand over several years and they'll say, okay, so this is your demand. Um, we're going to pick this line here. And you have to produce or have a certain amount of generation capacity above this line that we decide. And, it, and it's different in different places. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to learn more about it, there's a guy at a place called the Cato Institute. His name's Peter Van Dorn. Um, he does a bunch of stuff on regulation. And he's actually written some papers about this. Um, like, so it may be based off peak or it may be like average peak or some other, um, Mathematical curve. yeah, they've got some other formula that they decide, but it, it's like between 10 and 15% higher than what your peak is supposed to be. And people who think that, oh, these regulations are all good and that's Texas's problem. Um, they said that, like, that's the problem. If Texas had a regulation like that, then, um, this wouldn't have been a problem. 10 to 15 doesn't seem horrible. Well, so even though Texas does not have a regulation requiring that much excess generation, they have excess generation of 13%. <laughs> so. They're, they're still within that, even right. if they don't want to be. Uh, the problem was, well, because the market is providing that. There is financial incentive for the companies to build a certain amount of excess generation. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is they had a lot of, well, I had a lot of increased demand because people had to turn on their heaters and they maybe had to plug in space heaters and things like that, which are incredibly inefficient. Uh, space heater makes heat literally through electric resistance. So they're a huge power suck. Um, the one that we, so we have our electric radiator things at the barn. Yeah. Yeah. At maximum power, one of them will draw uh, 1500 watts, which is Oh awesome. my gosh. So if you ran it for two hours, it would draw like oh my 
three kilowatt hours. You could power a house that much. Uh, well, I mean, it's it's maybe, a big draw. Maybe a small house. I don't know. So they had this big increase in demand, and they had a lot of generation go offline all at the same time. So have you seen or heard this picture? The so the the frozen uh, wind turbines. Oh, I've heard of these. I remember that. Yes. Yeah, All right. So this is the one of the um, the pictures that's been going around because that's a power generation turbine it's supposed yeah. to be green energy. It's frozen, and so we have a helicopter uh, burning fossil fuels and spraying a petrochemical on them <laughs> to de-ice them. Um, so that was a problem, but it was not like the main problem. Uh, and when I say it's not the main problem, um, so the the green energy in Texas failed. Um, so the wind turbines got iced up and they stopped working. Solar panels got covered. That's a lot. You see wind turbines everywhere. Right. The wind turbines get covered with snow and their output is greatly reduced. Um, so the reports that I've read, it... Texas, during the winter, does not plan on having lots of uh, renewables. Uh, it, it's maybe only like 15% of their mix or something like that. Which is not a lot of renewables or not a lot of energy? Uh, like their total energy demand. So if they need like 80 gigawatts, then they only plan for like eight of those to come from renewables because they... Um, they produce less in the winter, right? When it's cloudier and dark, the solar panels don't get as much sunlight. It's not as windy or it gets cold enough for the turbines to freeze. So they plan for that. They plan for it to not play a big role. But part of the problem is, is that they uh, got down to where it was maybe only like 2% that they could actually supply. Oh my. So what they planned for it to actually provide, they could not provide. Arctic wind just said, nah. <laughs> no, no. Um, so what they plan to use most of their thing, uh, get, get, or get most of their electricity from, is this thing. It's combined cycle. So cycle, combined cycle power plant. A lot of people must have been looking up this term. Uh, all right. So uh, this uses natural gas. Oh. And this... Technology here is one of the reasons why the United States has reduced their greenhouse gas emissions by more than any other country in the world. Oh, well, that's good. Did you even know that that was true? No, I did not. The United States has reduced their greenhouse gas emissions by more than any other country in the world, and it wasn't because they tried to switch to... Uh, I mean, we've, we've built a lot of wind and solar, whether that's a good idea or not, mm -hmm. but they've switched from coal to these natural gas plants. And they are crazy efficient because uh, you're basically running two generators off of uh, one energy source. Oh my gosh. So you, natural gas comes in here, it sucks in air, it looks like a jet engine. It's got compressors in it and they burn it to spin these turbines. Oh. And so these turbines will turn the first generator here and it generates electricity. And then, if that was all you did, you have this exhaust of hot gas, right? So, you can imagine what comes out of the back of a jet engine. Lots of hot air, right? Yeah. So, instead of just exhausting that out to the atmosphere, they run these uh, water pipes through, and the heated exhaust gas, of course, gets heated up. It comes down through here, and they evaporate it. It turns into steam. Steam turns another turbine right down here, and it turns a second generator. It's a cycle. Yes. And that's why they call it combined cycle. Fair enough. And so you're burning the gas and using it to turn a turbine to generate electricity, and then you're using the exhaust that um, that, that process generates to heat up water and create steam to turn a second turbine. Oh, that's cool. And so you're, you can turn two turbines off of this one combined cycle 
uh, setup, and so that makes it very efficient. And because um, because natural gas emits a lot less carbon than other sources whenever it burns. A lot less than coal. Yeah, that means that um, it also emits a lot less particulate matter, like dust and ash and things like that. Oh. So the, the carbon emissions and the pollution are way down. So this has been a huge benefit for us uh, as a country. Now, if you'll notice, though, so they have these sort of setups in... Texas, and this is the kind of thing that they would normally plan to generate most of their power uh, during this kind of time because it doesn't rely on the vagaries of sunlight and wind. Like you can, you can basically throttle it almost like an engine. Like you can turn it off, you can turn it on, you can speed it up. Light switch. Yeah. Um, they typically will run it at around a, a set um, at a set speed so that the energy that they create is is good and clean because AC has a frequency and the grid likes it in a certain frequency. Mm -hmm. And so they won't necessarily throttle it up and down, but you can start these up and you can run them and um, you can you can bring more generation online um, to meet higher demand and you can take some offline to meet lower demand. So, but in Texas, a lot of these, uh, a lot of this sort of infrastructure here is sitting outside so that oh, it can really? bleed off heat because in the summer it gets really hot. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. So what do you think happens whenever you have an Arctic blast snowstorm come through and all this stuff sitting outside? It gets frozen up and cold. What, well, what do you see as a specific area of vulnerability the exhaust the exhaust like not this pipe of water oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes more sense actually i uh, just saw like stuff could get caught up in the exhaust or something no no like the water will actually freeze and it won't run oh that's wait isn't it running water well no because it's off yeah well so okay let's take a, a a step back so running water can freeze but um that that was a vulnerability so um part of the problem also was that as you can imagine similar to oklahoma in texas when do you think they use most of their power generation in the winter what nope sorry in that was my brain going dead. They do it in the summer because it's really hot. And what do we what do we do in the summer? We cool, we try to cool down. We we run, run air conditioning. We run lots of ACs. Sorry, so I was getting confused. In the winter, when the demand is lower, that will take plants offline to do repairs and maintenance to them. That seems like a generally good idea. Right. So they had some of these plants were all offline and they couldn't get them. Uh, online they had these water lines that were getting frozen uh, another thing that um, was a feature is so even though those plants are powered by natural gas they don't work if natural gas doesn't get to them oh. so what would you say is ah oh, well i'm not going to make you guess because i can't think of a good way to make you guess so, <laughs> so we get natural gas out of the ground yeah. and we pipe it in, but the natural gas isn't pure usually. It's got other things mixed so in. It needs with to it. be refined like oil? It doesn't necessarily need to be refined, it needs to be separated. Oh. One of the things that you have to separate out of it though, water vapor. So, it, you, wait, you can freeze natural gas? Um, depending on what stage it is, it has a certain amount of cold sensitivity. And I'm not a super expert on this, but um, so it comes up out of the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And it has water vapor in it. And then at some point they process it and they try and take as much of that water vapor out. And they will actually just have trucks like haul it off. Water vapor or natural gas? The, the water. They'll condense the water oh. out of it and they'll take it and they'll just fill up these tanks and the, then the trucks haul the, the water off. off the water. Yeah. Um, they try to get as much of the water vapor of, out of it as possible. You try. Um, so I don't know, like, 
between out of the out of the ground and you know to our power plant like how much water vapor is actually in it i don't know um but at some point in this line in the line there has already been some investigations and like that was a problem is even if you had a power plant that could operate that you um you know your water wasn't frozen your turbines weren't frozen uh, or you had winterized like you put insulation or some heating elements so that that stuff wouldn't freeze up um you may not have been able to get natural gas to actually fire it up and fire up that jet engine to get it going oh. so um i've seen two estimates uh so all of that demand comes up all that demand spikes all these people are turning on their heaters they're plugging in their space heaters they're trying to stay warm and at the same time between 33 percent and around 50 percent of texas's power generation capacity was completely offline uh, so, so between 33 and half Yes. Oh. And that, that's so, a lot of room. <laughs> that's frozen wind turbines, that's frozen gas pipes, that's dual cycle, you know, turbine plants with uh, frozen water pipes. Um, a lot of frozen pipes. Yeah, well, the the temperature, it was, a, it was what they call a hundred year uh, record event. So, like, if... If you were planning, like I gave you a bunch of money and I said, hey, Alexis, you're going to go and you're going to build a power plant out here, you know, in the field south of the house. How much money would you budget towards keeping that plant cool and how much would you budget towards keeping it warm in the winter? Um, we are in Oklahoma, so I would probably try to keep it cooler. Yeah, it, it's probably going to be hotter. And Texas is even hotter, especially yeah. as you get further south or when you get like into West Texas where it's like desert. Um, so the systems were just not built to withstand a hundred year record cold temperature. Well, we live in Oklahoma, so we should prepare for both. Yeah, we are a little schizophrenic. So, uh, but, you know... Uh, even here, I'm sure a lot of the plants, they weren't expecting for temperatures to be that cold. Oh, no. No one was expecting singular digits in Oklahoma, though. So, so that's what happened, is you had a huge uh, spike in, uh, in demand in, down in, well, I mean, in all of these areas. I know they said Louisiana got pretty bad, too. Um, in a lot of those states, the the systems were just not built to withstand that kind of cold. You had a huge spike in demand, and at the same time, you have this huge drop in uh, generation capacity. And it was, uh, you know, like I said, is perfect storm. All that stuff happened at the same time, and there just was not enough electricity to go around. And in a lot of places, they instituted blackout measures to keep from taking down the whole grid because the demand was, the supply and demand was so out of whack that basically everyone was going to lose power unless they managed it and they shut off certain people's power uh, mm -hmm. for certain limited amounts of time. That so. makes sense. Yeah. I see how it kind of dips by like Oklahoma and Texas. Imagine if it went through somewhere like Nevada, that's like literally the desert. That would suck. Oh well, they might like it. It'd be um, it'd be brisk for once. <laughs> well, maybe. Yeah. It would um, still, it might be torture. Yeah. So um, it is. I mean, it was an issue. Um, you know, the question is, what do you do moving forward? Uh, I personally am not a huge fan of. Uh, wind generation for grid power. Oh. Um, I, I was confused for a bit. I was like, you never really seen the mines. Like, 
generation? Well, I just think it's inconsistent. And if you look at a lot of the people who first started advocating for wind power, they were not advocating for wind power because it was going to generate a lot of uh, dense, high quality energy to sustain a high energy society, which is what we are. We use lots of energy all the time. Um, you know, they liked wind energy because it was going to be like they imagined us sort of stepping backwards to a pastoral sort of simpler existence. What's well, pastoral? Like the pasture. Ah. Yeah. yeah I see that. And so um, I like I like solar. I like it more for point sources. So like there's a chance because we go to church with a solar installer that at some point uh, we're going to try and get solar at the barn as backup. Because, oh, that's cool. Yeah, well, uh, if we can scratch together the money and I can finish all the other projects I'm supposed to do on the barn. And the pigs don't destroy our stuff every five minutes. Yeah, um, like it makes a great backup. It has a longer life uh, wind because it has mechanical connections. That stuff wears out. It breaks down. Um, both of these are intermittent uh, within the day and throughout the year. So even from like morning to night, the, there's no telling what you're going to get out of either of these sources. They're also intermittent throughout the year. So from, you know, one day to the next, one week to the next, one month to the next, um, it's really, you know, variable what kind of supply you're going to get out of it. Uh, and they take up a lot of land. Like you've seen the the wind generation that well, they take up a lot of space. That's why we're putting so many ocean. I saw that on like CNN where people are trying to make like wind farms yeah. in the ocean. That seems kind of cool though. So it's wind just it's not a dense energy resource compared to nuclear power, which mm. we pass you know. those sometimes. Like is it when we're going to Lawton? There's a certain place we go where we pass some of these the people. the only nuclear plant that I know that we pass is when we go to Arkansas. Well, there's another. I've seen like one that's a nuclear plant, and there's the one another we, one that looks the same. Like, what is the other one that looks kind of like it? The one that we pass when we go to the city is a natural gas plant. Oh, uh, natural gas and nuclear energy look similar. Uh, no, the cooling towers on nuclear are usually much bigger. Oh, okay. um, they have the same like cone yeah. shape. So nuclear power, like. Uh, you can build four, five, six, maybe even ten nuclear power plants in the space it takes to build a solar farm or a wind farm. Uh, they say that uh, to if we went totally to wind and solar, it'd take twenty five percent of the U.S. land mass to uh, just dedicated to. That's a lot of land mass. Yeah. So nuclear, we I like nuclear. I th I think it's it's safe. The, as long as you have like proper safety measures, because we'll, I keep forgetting the name of that one place that like Fukushima is the one that was the most recent one uh, in like, Japan. You're thinking of Chernobyl. Yes, I'm. I always forget its name. Like Chernobyl I, blew up because they were communists and they didn't know how to run stuff. <laughs> Did it have a mushroom cloud too? Uh, nuclear does. When it goes up, really? it doesn't mushroom cloud. It it, it, it will never a nuclear explosion. They're not set up that way. Movies lie. <laughs> um. Nuclear power plant is basically just like the combined cycle uh, power plant, except instead of, uh, you might only have one steam turbine instead of two. Uh, but instead of burning gas, you use a nuclear reaction to create heat. Nuclear fission. Yes. So um, I like hydroelectric. Um, hydroelectric is sort of fell out of vogue because you have to dam up rivers and people say it's bad for the environment. I guess it depends. Um, it, it could, I guess, be bad. If it's a major water source. Uh, well, we've got, a, we've got a bunch already built. Um, so tidal Dynamite. is similar and it's, it's using the tidal waves. It's much more consistent. Uh, uh, just and it, stop the tide. Yeah. You can't just decide to stop. One of the things I will, I'm the most interested about, we may need to do a whole new video on energy, but there's this thing, oh, it's, um, I think they call it binary cycle, uh, geothermal or low temperature. I heard of geothermal. We did. Okay. It was like a thing we could do for our project in science. 
So geothermal typically has been like you need hot rocks, like really hot rocks to make uh, geothermal. And they have... Oh, well, close. Like, we could borrow, we could, like, go over to Hawaii and see if we could use a volcano. It's downloading, right? <laughs> um, funny. But, uh, so maybe this binary one will work. There we go. Because so I think binary is a, a, another term for it, but, uh, oh, of Bruh. course, page not found. Uh, instead of using just water, they will use what's called a working fluid. And, um, I think it finished. yeah, I, I don't know that I want to open it. I need to check that. Right. And so they'll use a fluid that's similar to like what we use in our air conditioner and it will evaporate at a lower temperature. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you may or may not know this, but I bet if you ask some of the people that we know that we work in the oil field, like whenever they frack wells and stuff like that, yeah, a lot of times those wells will also produce hot water. What? So it's not boiling hot steam water like you get at Yellowstone, you know, where you have geysers and stuff, but it is hot water. Just like faucet hot water? Well, maybe not like that specifically, but not like scald your skin kind of water. Some of it's pretty hot. Oh, dang. That, that, that kind and of hot water. It's hot enough that you can evaporate a working fluid and you can use that to turn the turbine instead of just evaporating the water to steam. And so you can get geothermal power, which is a safe, it is consistent because it's not subject to, you know, the winds of things like um, wind and, and yeah, wind, cloud, sun. It's not subjected to the winds, uh, the whims of those sort of things. Um, we could use, we could be doing oil and energy. You could. You can convert fracked wells to geothermal plants, that probably. would be cool. Um, and it's, it's dense. Like, these resources that I like, they're, they're dense, which is what we need uh, to continue to run our society um, the way it is. Because we are energy dense, and we're only getting more energy dense. We're only demanding more and more electrical power. That makes sense, though. Yeah. So, do you have any more questions? We well, may, I have one. Can what? you evaporate oil? Oh, can you evaporate oil? Yes. You actually can. I was just wondering because it's like hot evaporating water with oil. Yeah. So the you can actually do that. I that was a joke question. The different constituent components of it. So like if we just poured out motor oil or something like that, uh -huh. it's got it's a combination of a bunch of different chemicals. But if you took whatever the compounds that are in there and you had them separated out they do have some kind of vaporation point okay okay then i'm good okay all right good job